Without further ado, um, let me introduce our first speaker, whom I hope you're all familiar with, but Bishop Alexander K. Sample is the 12th Bishop of the Diocese of Marquette. He was ordained a priest of the diocese June 1st, 1990 at this very cathedral. He served in parish assignments before moving to Rome, Italy from 1994 to 1996 to earn a degree in canon law. Upon returning to the diocese, he held a number of duties in the uh, diocesan pastoral office. He served as a member of the marriage tribunal, as chancellor, as a member of the College of Consultors, as director of the Department of Ministry Personnel Services, as director of the Bishop Berga Association, as diocesan chaplain to the Knights of Columbus, and was involved in many major efforts of the diocese. On January 25th, 2006, he was ordained Bishop of Marquette. Please help me welcome Bishop Alexander Sample. He has conquered death, he has conquered our sins, he has opened for us the way to salvation and eternal life. As we await during these days of Easter, the glorious feast of Pentecost, when you poured out your spirit upon the church, we ask you to send that spirit already, now, into our presence. Fill the hearts and the minds of these men who have gathered here. Anoint their hearts and minds, their ears, so that they may hear today a word that you wish them to hear for the building up of their faith. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit also to anoint the minds and the hearts and the tongues of those who will speak here today, that we will deliver a message that is your message. And so, Father, we place this day completely into your hands, knowing that in your own good way, you will lead it and guide it to a fruitful and successful conclusion. All of this we ask, Heavenly Father, through the same Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, our hope, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is great to see so many of you that have come here today. This is a wonderful showing. I appreciate it very much. I hope this day will be not only a day that will nourish you and, and give you a little boost. Quite honestly, brothers, today I hope that this day will be a life-changing day for you. As you'll hear, I hope, in my talk. How many, for how many of you is, let me, how, do, how shall I say this? How many of you were not at our last men's conference here in 2010? Raise your hand if you were not here. Great, great. Of course, that means that half of the guys that were here the last time didn't come back, so. I don't, I don't quite know what that means, but. Uh, I'm thrilled to see that for so many of you that you, you're here for the first time at our men's conference. That's a, that's a great sign of hope and, and growth for these conferences. And I hope some of you who are here for the first time were invited, encouraged, dragged here by one of your brothers who was here at the last conference and wanted you to experience the same thing that they experienced their first time. I do mean it when I say that I, I want this day for you to be a life-changing 
moment. And I hope, brothers, that today you will open your hearts, you will open your minds to the grace of God and allow God to enter into you and to fill you today. Let him speak to your heart in a new and powerful way. That's the best thing you can do today. If you want to know what is the best way to get through this day, it is to be open. It is to allow God to speak to you today through us who are going to give addresses through the sacrament you might receive today, through the fellowship of your brothers in Christ. In whatever way God chooses to speak to you today, be open and allow God to work in your life because now is the time. Now is the time when we need you to step up, as Emerald, the chef, says, to kick it up a notch. It's time. Now more than ever. And I'll get to that in my address with you. The title of my address to you men this morning is Men of the New Evangelization. And that's a pretty broad and kind of innocent sounding topic. I hope by the time I'm finished, it will take on some life for you. The last time I spoke to you, I'll put you second timers on the spot. You remember what the title of my talk was the last time? Very good. What does a bishop mean? And I told you men at the last conference what I as your bishop mean from you. None of that changes. All of that stays in place. And if you, if you were here, you remember what I said. If you weren't here, you can get the CDs and listen to what I said. Because all that stays. None of that changes. What I hope today is to build on that and to challenge you even more. To call us all, myself included, to a deeper commitment to Christ and to his church. I need you men, my brothers in Christ, in the Catholic community, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, of Michigan, to get deadly serious about the work of the new evangelization. When I say deadly serious, I mean it. It's time for us all to stop making excuses for ourselves, to stop procrastinating, to stop putting it off for another day, to stop thinking, well, there's time for my spiritual life or my life of faith later. You know, after the kids are out of the home, when I retire, whatever. The time is now, and I need you step up and to take this very seriously. Okay, new evangelization. We've heard a lot about it. I'm sure if I polled you right now and said, what does the new evangelization mean to you? About every man in this church would come up with a different response to that. I would say, if I ask my brother priest, and I see at least one here, Father question, what that means, they would all have a little different take on what the new evangelization means. And so if I'm going to talk to you guys about being men of the new evangelization, you have to have an idea about what I'm talking about. And I'm going to share with you what that new evangelization means, and it's, it's coming from certainly my own thoughts, my own prayer, my own reflection, but it's also coming from my own study and listening myself to what the Holy Father is saying, to what Blessed John Paul II said, what the Church is saying about this new evangelization. But we have to understand what we're talking about if we're going to be men of the new evangelization. Because, and, and a lot of what I'm going to share with you in the first part of my talk, brothers, comes from actually 
our visit just in the first week in February to Rome, or the bishops on leave of the visit, the bishops of, of Michigan and Ohio went for our five-year visit to the Holy See, to the Holy Father, to the various congregations. And one of the congregations we visited is the new Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. Benedict XVI, our Holy Father, established this new council to put the work of the new evangelization in the heart of the church and to call us to that work. And so we visited that new council and we learned there what is the Holy Father thinking? What is his vision for this new evangelization? And the first thing that we were told was that we, in our society today, and this speaks especially to us in the West, and particularly to us in the United States, we are confronted with two realities that have taken root in our society that are a grave, grave challenge to us. Relativism and secularism. Relativism, this idea that, well, you know, everything has a little bit of value and truth to it, and some may choose to follow this path, some may choose to follow that path. You know, what's right for me, you know, may not be right for everyone. What's true for me might be different from what's true for someone else, as if truth can contradict itself. How can truth contradict itself? If what's true for you contradicts what's true for me, how can we say it is truth? There is only one truth. And so, but this idea of relativism, and you think about it, it is strong in our culture. The currents of relativism are very, very strong. And we, we have given into it. We are susceptible to it. In subtle ways that we may not even notice and be aware, we fall into it. Well, you know, I kind of look the other way, and I can't really judge that. Who am I to, to judge that as wrong? you know, I wouldn't do that, but hey, you know, freedom, right? St. Paul tells us, so freedom is not freedom to licentiousness and sin, it's freedom in the truth, to live freely in the truth. So that's one. And of course, the other thing that we face is secularism. What does that mean? It means, quite bluntly, it means the ripping out from the fabric of our society, God. Religion, spiritual values. We live in an age where God is pushed to the sidelines. He's pushed right out of the public square, right out of the public debate. You keep your religion stuff to yourself and don't talk about it. Keep it in your churches. But when you walk out the door of the church, leave it here. Don't bother us with your religious values and beliefs and moral values. And you have no right to have a voice at the table in the public debate that goes on that forms the fabric of our society. Keep religion out of it. We have people actively fighting against us and our moral values and principles that we are called to bring to the public square. Secularism, a completely secularized culture where God is barely mentioned and where other values drive human life and activity. That's what we're confronted with. Those two things, this relativism and the secularism, the rabid secularism, are grave challenges to us, men of faith. They are a grave challenge to the work of the church in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what we face today. And it is in the face of this that the Holy Father has called us to this work of the new evangelization. Because these are challenges not only for us as believers, but they are especially challenges to non-believers. To remain 
people of faith committed to Jesus Christ, committed to our faith in the church, is very hard today. So, we need the new evangelization to address, to confront, to deal with the reality that we find ourselves in. Now, the first thing to know about the new evangelization, however, is that the, evangeliz the new evangelization is directed first to believers. The new evangelization, brothers, is directed first to us. It is directed not to the world outside the church as a mission. It is called the mission ad gentes, in Latin, ad gentes, to the Gentiles, it means to the nations. The church certainly has a missionary call to bring the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and our faith to all the nations, to all those people in far off lands who have never heard the good news. That's the missionary work of the church, ad gentes. That's not what we're talking about in the new evangelization. It's important to understand that. We're not talking in the new evangelization about going off to some faraway country to bring the message of Jesus Christ to someone who's never heard the good news. The new evangelization is directed to believers, to people who are already baptized, but who, for whatever reason, are away from the church. That's to whom the new evangelization is directed, to the baptized, who aren't here with us in particular. Certainly it's directed to us who are here. We'll talk about that, how it starts with us. But really this work of the new evangelization is to get to those people who have left the practice of their faith for whatever reason, or who are so tenuous in the practice of their, they're, they're holding on by a thread. You know, the, the Easter Christmas thread. They're barely with us. They're not alive in the faith. That is to whom this new evangelization is directed. To bring them back by starting with ourselves. And the three priorities, if you will, or the three, uh, you kind of see it this way. Let's say, you know, the church has called us to this work of the new evangelization, and it's going to be an effort, it's going to be a, a, almost a battle, if you will. And this battle for the new evangelization is going to be uh, run on three different fronts, if you will. There are going to be three fronts to this effort. The first is, no, I'm sorry, there are two priorities, I'll get to the three fronts later. There are two priorities to this new evangelization. There are two goals, if you will. These are the objectives of the new evangelization. In other words, what are we going to try to accomplish? When we get well down the road with this new evangelization, we're going to start measuring if we are accomplishing our goal. What is our goal? There are two. Number one is the formation of a strong, Catholic identity that we have to form in ourselves a very strong Catholic identity of who we are. Because brothers, there are millions of us Catholics who do not know the most basic content of our faith. They simply don't know. And I know that some of us here, I know it is, because I'm looking out here, and I'm looking at faces, 
And I'm seeing guys around my age and younger, and I know what our generation and younger grew up with. You know, I stood, I stood on the floor of the U.S. Bishops Conference in one of our meetings, and I stood up and I said, I consider myself at age 51 part of the first lost generation that grew up in the wake of the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, and it's not the Council's fault, so don't misunderstand me. The Council said nothing about creating a body of people who are ignorant of their faith. I haven't found that anywhere in the documents of Vatican II that said we are to abandon catechesis, water down our catechesis, sow seeds of confusion among the people of God, and weaken the practice of faith. I haven't found that statement in Vatican II. But when you think about the times, you know, the late 60s into the 70s, and all the cultural revolution that was going on, the sexual revolution, the radical feminism, the move against authority, the, the anti-war movement being a big part of that, the distrust with authority, the throwing off of the shackles of the past, this was the spirit of the times. And I grew up in that time. And I graduated from high school one sorry, confused cat. Very confused. Not sure what we believed in. Very uneasy. And I know that's some of you and young, because my generation has now raised up another generation that's equally or maybe more ignorant of their faith. And so to, to create this strong sense of Catholic identity, who we are, to form the faithful, to educate us, to help us know what we believe and why we believe it, that's the first goal. The second goal is to create a strong sense of belonging to the church. This is very important. I'm going to talk a lot about this. This is very important. To create in the Catholic people, those still here, and those who have drifted away, a strong sense of belonging to the church. That to be a disciple of Jesus Christ necessarily means belonging to his church. Absolutely, unequivocally, that is the will of Christ. And so it isn't just about me knowing my faith and practicing my faith as best I can and having a relationship with Christ. It means belonging to the church and having a strong sense of that. I can't be a Catholic. I can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ without being part of this body of the church. So these are the two primary goals of the new evangelization. To form a strong sense of Catholic identity and to create a strong sense of belonging to the church. Now, I jumped ahead of myself. Now, the three fronts of the new evangelization. This, this battle is going to be waged on three fronts. And this is coming right from the Pontifical Council on the new evangelization. The liturgy, formation, catechesis, and charity. Those are the three fronts. The liturgy. The liturgy is that peculiar, particular space within which the work of the new evangelization has to take place. In the sacred liturgy, we, the church, are the church to the greatest degree. When we, the church, gather for the celebration of the sacred liturgy, of the holy sacrifice, of the mass, we are never more the church than when we are gathered in divine worship in the holy mass. The church 
believes, teaches, has always believed and taught that the, the sacred liturgy, the Eucharist, is the source and the summit of the church's life. Blessed John Paul II, in his very last encyclical letter to the church, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, on the Holy Eucharist, said, nothing new, but repeated for us in the strongest terms, the church draws her life from the Eucharist. And so in the celebration of the sacred liturgy, we are formed as the people of God. The liturgy itself has a formative power. Through the prayers, through the scriptures, of course through the reception of Holy Communion, through the offering of the once for all sacrifice of Christ, through all of that the people of God are formed, and especially in the homily, in the homily, we are taught, and there's a great, great emphasis and thrust these days toward, in, toward trying to encourage more and more and more in the homily at Mass catechesis. Not that the homily becomes simply a, a, a catechetical lesson, but that as much as possible, catechesis is infused into the homily so that we can be taught, so that we can be formed, so that we can get that strong sense of Catholic identity, where we can be taught things that maybe we've never heard or we've forgotten. It's time to get back to basics in terms of what we believe and what we have always believed. And that's why the liturgy, and you'll see me as your bishop more and more and more paying a lot of attention to the liturgy writing a pastoral letter on the liturgy. And we need to recapture in the liturgy that sense of the church at worship and being formed by the mysteries we celebrate there. And we need to celebrate the liturgy with the greatest devotion, reverence, prayerfulness, solemnity, joy, fervor, zeal. The liturgy, I believe, needs to be revitalized, needs to be, quite honestly, reformed. You know, our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, speaks of the reform of the reform. The reform of the reform. What does he mean? Well, the liturgy was reformed after the Second Vatican Council. We all know that. You know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you read my column yet. Catholic this week. <laughs> but read it. Because so much has been done in the name of Vatican II that Vatican II never asked for. It was the things that happened after Vatican II. And a lot of the developments in the liturgy over the last 50 years or so have not all been good. And I think we have to acknowledge that and not be afraid to say that and not think that we're turning our back on Vatican II or we're turning back the clock. I hear all these sorts of things, you know. Oh, gosh, we're going to go back. Turning back, we're not moving forward, we're moving back. No, I think we need to be honest. We need to be courageous enough to say that everything that has happened in liturgical development since the Second Vatican Council has not been good. Much of it has been very good and wonderful and what we needed. But not everything that has happened is good. And we need to recapture some of what we have lost in the liturgy. You know, the Holy Father points out very clearly that the liturgy is not about the community expressing itself. See, that's kind of what I grew up with. You know, the liturgy has to be expressive of the community. You know, that's why we were constantly tinkering with it when I was growing up. Maybe some of you remember this. And I remember going to Mass week after week, just wondering what's going to happen this week. What's going to be different this week? What does the liturgy committee come up with this week? Always tinkering, always experimenting, always trying to make the liturgy somehow express the community. A lot of experimentation. The Holy Father 
really the Christ's. That's not what the liturgy is. The liturgy is what it is. I don't like that expression because everybody uses it. It is what it is. But the liturgy is what it is. We don't create the liturgy. The liturgy is given to us. The liturgy comes to us across 2,000 years of development. You know, the church didn't begin at Vatican II. The liturgy didn't begin at Vatican II. The liturgy comes to us across centuries of tradition and development. And we need to see the liturgy in the, in the context of the whole history of the church. The liturgy is what it is. It is the renewal of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. So how we celebrate the liturgy must express what the liturgy is, not what we're trying to make it to be. The liturgy needs to form us. We're not to form the liturgy. We're to participate in the liturgy. We're to enter into the mystery. We're to be taken out of ourselves. The community needs to transcend itself and be drawn into the divine. To have an experience that is literally otherworldly, not making it worldly. The new translation of this, some of you may not like it. I love it. Because it is recapturing a sense of the sacred, dignity, beauty, rich liturgical theological texts that are ancient, that express the faith, so that when we pray the liturgy, we are taught, we are catechized. One little quickie example. You know, I heard somebody, I was on a radio show the other night, Somebody, you know, referred to it as the C word in the creed now. That's everybody stumbles over. Consubstantial. Okay. Consubstantial with the Father. Simply a translation of the Latin, consubstantialis. We used to say one in being. Now we have consubstantial. That challenges us. That word challenges us. Now I can take the attitude of saying, ah, what does that word mean? Why did they change that word? Or we had said, what in being all those years? Wasn't that good enough? Why do we have to change that? Now nobody understands what the heck we're saying. And blah, 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 blah. I've heard it. That challenges us. That's a rich philosophical, theological word. That has a precise meaning. Consubstantial, to be one in substance with the Father, to share the same substance of the Father. That word was crafted out of, after heated, heated theological debate in the early church. The Arian heresy and the, the Nestorian heresies, Christological heresies of the early church. That word wasn't just, you know, let's, let's use consubstantial. That was a precise word, and we need to understand what it means to be of the same substance of the Father. Another change in the creed. He was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. Now what do we say? Nobody looked at your cheek parts in the pew. <laughs> he was incarnatus est. He was incarnate. by the power of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. He was incarnate. He became flesh. The Son of God did not take on human flesh when he was born in the stable of Bethlehem, born of the Virgin Mary. That immediately, does that immediately conjure up in your mind? He was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. My mind goes to Bethlehem to the stables. Et incarnatus est, and he was incarnate, means the eternal Word of God took on human flesh, was incarnate, took on a human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit at His conception. The incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation is what's being spoken of there. This is what I mean, that the liturgy needs to be formative. This isn't a talk on the liturgy, so I'll stop. So the liturgy needs to form us. It needs to be a primary front in this battle for the new evangelization. Secondly, formation of the faithful. 
a deepening of our faith. The Holy Father has declared next year is a year of faith, and he's calling us to look especially at the four pillar documents of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, the Constitution of the Church, Gaudium et Spes, the Church in the Modern World, Sacrosanctum Concilium on the Sacred Liturgy, and Dei Verbum, on the Word of God. And to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the fruit of the Council. How many of you, don't raise, raise your hand, how many of you have a catechism of the Catholic Church in your home that you look at regularly? <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, the old days, you know, you have the Bible. <laughs> you know, now we have the catechism of the Catholic Church gathered with us somewhere. Only five clients to do this to study this. We have to form ourselves, brother. We have to learn more about our faith. We have, to, we have to study, read, pray, deepen our faith, learn more and more and more and more about what we believe and why we believe it. That has to happen for all of us. If we're going to share the good news, we have to know the good news. So that's the second front. We have to work very hard at catechesis, faith formation, I say especially adult faith formation, education. Third front is charity. The works of charity. We have to show forth the merciful, loving face of Christ to the world. Through our works of charity, of service to the world, to the needy, to the poor, to those who go without, we show forth and witness to our faith. And that's important. Because it, it isn't enough as Catholics to know our faith. I could have the Catechism memorized. I could go to daily mass and go to confession once a week. But if I don't have charity, what does St. Paul say? I am nothing. I am nothing. Without love, it's meaningless. The church has to witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. The church has to witness to the mercy we have received from him and give it to others. The church has to do works of mercy, of charity, in order to bear witness to the Christ who has loved us so. So those are the three fronts. So this pontifical council is going to lead the whole church in these areas for the new evangelization, liturgy, catechesis, faith formation, and charity. Now, some of you, I'm not going to go through these except just to listen. How many of you guys, because I know we had a lot of Knights of Columbus here, how many of you guys were on the Knights of Columbus retreat this year? Anybody here? Okay, good. Good number of hands. I shared with the guys on Knights of Columbus retreat, it was before the visit to the Holy See, so my talk would have probably changed after that, but I shared with them seven pastoral priorities that Blessed John Paul II outlined for the church in the new millennium. And these seven pastoral priorities are going to form a, a, a skeletal network, if you will, of what we're going to be about in the Diocese of Marquette for the new evangelization. I'm just simply going to listen. Number one, the call to holiness. We need to take seriously each and every one of our own call to holiness. Number two, prayer. To learn how to pray more and to pray more. Number three, the Sunday Eucharist. The Sunday Eucharist, Sunday Mass, has to become the centerpiece of the Lord's day for us. The Sunday Mass has to be the centerpiece of our son of the Lord's day. Now, I'm a huge Packer fan. Sorry, blind fans. <laughs> Some of them that are worth the bears. But the Packer game is the highlight of our Sunday. The Holy Mass has to be the highlight of our Sunday. And the beginning of our week. You know, I shared this with the guys that I said I guess I wasn't the same thing, of course. Give me a microphone and I'll just go on and on. You know, tell me if this isn't true. How do you look at Sunday? I mean, be, be honest. 
Is Sunday for you the first day of the week, or is it the last day of the weekend before you have to go back to work? And I think really for most of us, most of our lives, we look at it from the latter. You know, Sunday comes, and oh, it's, the weekend's almost over. Got to go back. You know, think about Friday afternoon when you punch out, when you leave the office, you know, and oh, the weekend's here. Ah, go. <laughs> yeah, that's what it does to me. <laughs> it used to, anyway, for, you know, coming to the weekend, now it's work. But, all oh, the weekend's here. You know, I'm going to have to get up early tomorrow and go to work. We're going to, yeah, I've got to hold a lot and do that stuff, but we're all going to have fun this week. And then Sunday comes, and it's like, oh, the weekend's almost over. i got to go back to work tomorrow. Sunday is not meant to be that. Sunday is supposed to be the first day of the week. Sunday is the day that sets us off for the week, gets us going for the week, gives us the grace we need for the week. The Eucharist, the source and the sum of the church's life. The church draws her life from the Eucharist. We should come away from the Eucharistic altar of the Lord on Sunday ready to go for the week. Not dreading that the weekend's almost over. So we have to shift the way we think about the Sunday Eucharist. Four, renewal of the sacrament of penance. And no, do not raise your hand or do not shout out answers. But ask yourself in your heart, when was the last time I went to confession? How often do I go to confession? Am I a Lent Advent guy? Or maybe just a Lent guy? You know, well, it's... They're having these penance services and it's a very good confession. We don't go to confession uh, because the calendar says it's time to go to confession. We go to confession when we need to go to confession, when we need reconciliation, especially if we have sinned seriously, gravely, mortal. You know, it's, it's, if any of us who hear confessions will tell you, you know, we get those Easter or Lent Advent confessions, you know, it's been a year since my last confession. And folks are listening to all kinds of things that are mortal sins. And they continue to go to communion unreconciled. You're like going, wait a minute, it's been a year since your last confession. You're confessing things that are great matter, they're serious stuff. You continue to go to communion. Again, formation of our faith. And I'm not, you know, some people may simply not know. And we maybe, we, the guys that wear these, may not have done a very good job in speaking clearly about what the church teaches, sacrament. So we need to renew our sacrament of penance. The primacy of grace, this is all in God's hands. We're not in control. God is in control. We have to rely on God. It's not our ingenuity. It's not our planning. It's not our ideas. It's not our programs. It's not our committees. It's not our strategic plans. It's God's work in our lives. Listening to the Word of God. Meditating on the Word of God. Especially in Scripture, but also in the tradition and the teachings of the church. Taking it in. Again, being formed. And then proclaiming the Word of God. It's the seventh pastor priority. Proclaiming, sharing what we have received. Okay. That is the best I can express it to you what the new evangelization is all about. And you can see it's directed primarily to us and to those who are no longer with us but who are baptized. Now I want to just shift gears just slightly. Yesterday, in the Gospel, for yesterday's Mass, Jesus, you know, was talking to the, the Apostles about, you know, I'm going away now, and I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a dwelling place for you, and, and I'll, I'll come back, and I'll take you with me, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Disciples ask the Lord, you know, we don't know where you're going, Lord. How can we know the way? Philip. 
We don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And I always read it differently. You know, I, I've heard other deacons, priests, read this, this gospel, you know, the, the line, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life comes next, you know. It's often read, you know, uh, you know, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And it's, it's read, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is fine. But when I read it, I read it because I think it's this emphasis. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. You want to know the way? You want to know the way to eternal life? I am the way, Jesus says. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We must come to believe this ever more and anew in this age of relativism, in, this, in the face of relativism that says, oh, there are many paths to salvation, and some might choose this path, and some might choose that path, and, you know, I heard, I heard, I heard a very good Catholic once say to me, this was probably 20 years ago, very good Catholic, saying, well, I think we all have a little piece of the truth. You know, Catholics have a piece of the truth. Other Christians have a piece of the truth. You know, Jews have a piece of the truth. Islam has a piece of the truth. Hinduism has a piece of the truth. Everybody, God kind of spread the truth out like that. Everybody has a little piece of it. Uh-uh. <laughs> no! I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus said it clearly. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, be careful. The church clearly teaches that one does not have to be a baptized, registered member of the Roman Catholic Church in order to get to heaven. The church teaches it. People of goodwill, who are following the dictates of their conscience and seeking God as best they can in, in, in the shadows and in the darkness of ignorance, they can be saved. They can be saved. And see, what I think, what we've come to in our own mind is not that they can be saved. We come to, they are saved. Everybody's saved. God loves everybody. Everybody, you know, we, we turn God into you know, something that he is. We create our own image of God. You know, he comes, he is merciful, but he is judge, too, of the living and the dead. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Jesus talks about that final judgment which separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus is the way. So even those who are saved outside the church are saved by the church and by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way to salvation. And His church, His church is the universal sacrament of salvation. All salvation comes through Christ, and all salvation comes through the church. So even that person in a far distant land who's never heard the name of Jesus Christ who might be saved, because they are a person of goodwill, who follow the dictates of their conscience as God speaks to them as best He can in their darkness and ignorance. Even that one who is saved is saved through the church. In a mysterious and extraordinary way, all salvation is mediated by the church, because all salvation comes through Christ. And, and this is what, this idea that there is no objective truth is one of the biggest lies of our age. We, the, 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 dic, the Holy Father calls it the dictatorship of relativism. It's the only thing that must be held by everyone, and that is that there, everybody is fine. There is no objective truth that binds all of us. That's the great gospel of, of our culture. And we have to point out the lie. It is not true. Jesus is the truth. 
He is the truth. He is the revelation of God the Father. In Him is the fullness of truth and life. We must never lose sight of that. That's why there's an ever urgency to share this gospel. Because, yes, other people can be saved who don't know Jesus, who don't know the church, but how much more difficult it is for them. How much harder is it for them who have not the benefit of the Word of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ and His church that lead us and point out to us what is right and what is wrong, the paths to goodness and wholeness and happiness. How much harder of time they would have it without the grace of the sacraments, the Eucharist, reconciliation. It's harder for them. And we want everyone to come. We, we love this. We know this truth to be so beautiful, so wonderful. We, we have to share it with others. So don't, don't buy into the lie that there is no objective truth. Jesus Christ is the truth and His church teaches the truth because Jesus and His church are one. Are one. This comes down to this idea of belonging to the church. My brothers, Jesus Christ and His church are one. They are inseparable. You cannot separate Jesus Christ from His church. And we hear it we say it. Well, well, we don't like something that the church teaches. Well, we don't like something the church challenges us with, especially in the moral realm. Well, yeah, I know that's what the church teaches. But Jesus, you know, we, the but. But Jesus would. We can't separate Jesus from his church. He, he gave us the church. He identifies himself with the church. When he comes to Paul on the road to Damascus, what does he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you persecuting me? Because Paul was persecuting the church. Jesus identifies with the church. He gave us the church. He empowered the church through the teaching of the apostles and with the gift of the Holy Spirit to always speak the truth in His name. You cannot separate Jesus from His church. They are one. Recently, Cardinal Dolan, who was the poster child for Catholicism in the United States, great man, known him since he was on senior dole. Great man. He's president of our bishops' conference, the last bishops' conference, and he gave his first presidential address. And he said this, and he kept repeating this line, it's a line from Blessed John Paul II, by the way. And I say it to you men. Love for Jesus and his church must be the passion of our lives. Love for Jesus and His Church must be the passion of our lives. And he wasn't just talking to bishops. He, these words of John Paul II were addressed to the whole church. You know, the church is in, we've got our problems. The people who wear the collar sometimes scandalize us, disappoint us. But you know what they have throughout history? You now look who Jesus picked. You know, Jesus picked as an apostle, as an apostle, the guy who was for 30 pieces of silver going to sell him out. He picked Peter, who was going to deny him three times. And many times just wasn't going to get it. But to whom he later gave the keys of the kingdom. The church has always had been marked by sin. You, know, you said, you know, you're kind of in loving the church. You, you accept the bride, you know, with all her warts. But she's still the spotless bride of Christ. Because people today 
seem to want to have Jesus without the church. You know, he, the, the Cardinal Dolan went through this litany. He says they want a king, but not a kingdom. They want a shepherd, but they don't want a flock. They want to believe without belonging. They want a spiritual family with God as my father, as long as I'm an only child. They want spirituality without religion. They want faith without the faithful. They want Christ without his church. And you can't have it. You can't have Christ without his church because they are one. The church is the mystical body of Christ. We need to turn this around. You need to take the lead in this, my brothers. We need to get over it. We need to get over whatever gripes, whatever disappointments, whatever anger we have with this bishop or that priest or that finance council member or whatever. We need to get over it. We're always going to have sinners. I'm not perfect, but I don't think any of you are either. We're always quick to point fingers at other people in the church and find reasons and excuses for being mad or being angry or walking away or staying away for a while or resigning from this council or resigning from that committee. You know, we need to get over it. We're always going to have these struggles in the church because we're human beings. We are the mystical body of Christ. We are the spotless bride of Christ. But this body, this bride is made up of many members. And we're all sinners. You wouldn't believe the letters I get. You know, expressing anger. You know, with, with some sometimes they're serious things, but sometimes they're such silly and petty things. You know, and, and you know, sometimes I think, you know, where's this person coming from? We need to get over all of our disappointments because we are still the church. We are still that instrument of salvation that Christ has given us. I say this in anticipation to this week and all of the new announcements are coming out for the priest moves. So guys, don't write any letters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do the best I can. That's, that's, that's one of the times each year I, I just brace myself with a flood of angry letters. Why did you move, Father? We about them. You don't know what you're doing. You obviously don't understand us. You're an idiot. You know, whatever. You know, uh, I do the best I can. I have to look out for the whole church. I have to take into consideration the needs of our priests, the needs of the communities, the problems of shortage of priests. I wish, I wish I had the perfect priest for every parish. That would just be the perfect man. After about five years of doing this work in their Bishop Garland, I realized there is no perfect plan. You do the best you can, but you realize that the bishop has to look to the goods of the whole church. He's got a lot that he's trying to balance and take care of. 94 parishes and missions with about 50-some priests. You know, every parish with different problems and personalities and health problems and issues with the priests. I mean, it's, you do the best you can. So please understand this if, if you're one of the parishes this week and it's going to be ticked. <laughs> Just give it a week before you write me a letter. <laughs> Nothing's more important, men. We need to take the lead to make our faith the most important thing in our lives. In the face of the secularism of our day, we need to take it seriously. Listen to Romans chapter 14, beginning to verse 7. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord, so that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Another translation, the old American, New American Bible translation said, None of us lives as his own master, none of us dies as our own master. As we live, we live for Christ. As we die, we die for Christ, so that whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord, we are his. Your life is his. It's not your own. It's not yours. You know, we, we, we tend to take it as our own life. There's a beautiful prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the Sushi Pay prayer, which really is kind of a summary of the spiritual exercises. 
Receive, O oh Lord, all my liberty. Take my memory, my understanding, my entire will. Whatsoever I have or hold, thou hast given me. I give it all back to thee and commit it wholly to be governed by thy will. Thy love and thy grace give unto me. And I am rich enough and ask for nothing more. My brothers, that's how we have to live our lives. Your life is not your own. It is a pure gift of God. The fact that you exist, the fact that you're sitting here today in these pews, is purely a gift from God. Your life is not your own. You belong to Him. And yet we go about living our lives as if it were our own. But remember, this life is not what it's about. This life is not what it's about. It's eternal life. I look out here and I see young guys, really young guys. It's great to see the young guys here. I mean that. But I see a lot of gray hair out there, too. And a lot of no hair out there, too. <laughs> guys, you know, I'm going to put it bluntly and boldly. And it's good to meditate on this once in a while. I hate to break it to you, but you're going to die. You're going to die. Each and every one. And when we die, how much money we made, what our position was in the company, how much authority and power we had, what kind of house we lived in, what kind of car we drove, what kind of clothes we wore, how pretty our wife was. None of that's good. None of it. So why do we spend our whole lives putting all of our effort into these things? Would that we would put as much effort into preparing for heaven and preparing our wives and our children and our grandchildren for heaven instead of worrying about what sports they play or what extracurricular activities they're involved in. You know, dads are proud. You know, when your kid's the star hockey player, quarterback of the football team. Yeah, you can't help but be proud. But your job isn't to get your son or your daughter those sorts of things. Your job is to get them to heaven and to get yourself to heaven and to get your spouse to heaven. That's your job. That's what it's about. That's what being men of the new evangelization is about. So brothers, I can't tell you enough. Get deadly serious about this. I plead. Take it seriously. Take your life of faith seriously. Take your relationship with Jesus Christ as the most important thing. Not just as part of it, but as your whole, everything you're about. I need you. Church needs you more than ever. If you don't do it, and I, I, I mean this very sincerely, you guys gave up your Saturday to come here. I don't know what else you could have done today. It's like pretty good golfing weather. You gave up your, your Saturday to come here because you obviously take it seriously. But brothers, if you don't do this, if you don't step up to the plate, if you don't kick it up a notch, if you don't get deadly serious about this and make it everything you're about, who will? In the face of the relativism and secularism in our age today, if you guys don't stand up and do it, God help us. Because the guys, I mean, there are probably some guys who couldn't be here, would have loved to have been here, but couldn't be here. But there's a lot of guys who saw it in the bullet and then forget that. You guys, if you guys who take it seriously don't step up and do what needs to be done to change the culture, to be men of the new evangelization, then no one will. No one will. And we priests are going to be left you know, looking behind us to see who's following, who's going to help us lead this effort. So brothers, 
That's the new thing a bishop needs. He needs you to be men of faith. Men who are deadly serious about the business of salvation for yourselves, for your families, for our church, and for our culture. God bless you and thank you for your rapid attention. stay up as a fast and forego lunch if we could get the bishop to do some more preaching like that. Thank you so much.